So let's start then with the introduction. So just we'll have a look at the overview of the course. So the first part of the course uh, we'll start today is about competing in international markets. So we'll talk about the company. So what is the advantage for companies? Pros and cons means advantage and disadvantage. So what's the advantage and disadvantage for companies to compete internationally? Then within the industry, we'll talk about industry. So the company should make should have a competitive advantage. We'll talk about that. And we'll talk about the market of uh, consumers in the different markets. Different markets have different culture and different politics and economics. Then we look at the market assessment and development. So we look at market research, international market research. We look at market segmentation, how to divide the market and where to position your product. <coughs> then the third part is managing the international marketing program. We're doing some branding and advertising adapting your product, changing your product for the different markets, and the supply chain, finding a way to sell your product there. So let's start with some definitions. Uh, you can see global marketing and international marketing. Global means most of the world, like Africa, Europe, America, okay? International means just one, more than one country. If you're doing business in two countries, with an office in two countries, or a factory in two countries, then you can call yourself an international company. But you're not a global company. Okay? Global, can you name any global companies? Samsung. Samsung. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. McDonald's. McDonald's. If you're a domestic com company, then it means you only do business in your home country. <coughs> International trade, trade is selling and buying, importing or exporting. International business, uh, a, co a company is an uh, ME when they're doing international business. So we could do international trade, which means we're just <coughs> exporting, right? We don't have any factory or office in another country. So we just send our goods by ship or airplane. However, we become an NNE, multinational enterprise, if we have international operations and production. So that means we produce something abroad. We have a factory in another country. Okay? Or we have an office, research and development office in another country. So this is an MNE. International marketing, definition, the performance of business activities designed to plan, price, promote, and direct the flow of a company's goods and services to consumers or users in more than one nation for a profit. So we're planning, promoting, pricing uh, our goods and services. So just discuss with your partner. What do you think? How is international marketing going to be different from domestic marketing? So you're just a Korean domestic country and you just sell your product in Korea, right? How is that going to be different? <coughs> you have to sell your product in China or Europe or the US. So discuss with your partner. How will the marketing be different? What kind of differences will there be? So if you don't have a partner, then sit next to somebody. Okay. You need to do some discussion activity in the class. You don't have to marry them, right? And just sit next to them and discuss about marketing for one class. Culture. International marketing. Culture. Low. Low. Regulation. Uh, and there could be the tax problems. Uh, 
Texas. You guys from Boston, Texas. Taiwan. Yeah. Yeah. Texas. Boston. Yes? This is your I And then we are entering a new country's market. And there will be a new, new competitor. Okay. So can anybody tell me any difference for the international marketing? What do you think? Is it more complicated or the same? Why is it more complicated? Because there could be a cultural difference. Culture? Yeah. <coughs> Another complication? Politics and economics. Hmm? Politics and Politi <coughs> Political and economic? Yeah. We all call all of these things environment. Environment. <coughs> Okay. Anything else? And you have to invest more money in people. Okay. We need more investment. <coughs> Maybe stop. Anything else? Exchange rate. Country, this kind of risk, right? Exchange rate risk. Okay. Well, let's look at. Here we can see this is the domestic environment and foreign environment. And these are things we can control. These are things we can't control. So first of all, the domestic environment we can control. We can control our product and the price, promotion, research, and our own company. Okay? We can't control political or legal forces, economic, so we could change the law, right? For example, if we are selling some product which damaged the environment, they could change the law and then we don't can't sell our product anymore. Economy and competition. We have our domestic competition. Then we go out to the foreign environment. They're going to be different, right? We have new competition, maybe better competition. Different types of economy and culture, geography, level of technology, right? We want to sell FIFA Online or League of Legends in, in uh, Zimbabwe, right? Maybe they don't have, everybody doesn't use the, have the fast internet connection, which can't play the game on the fast internet connection, right? So the level of technology in the country also affects. So we have different things, uh, different environment in different countries, which will affect the marketing. So, <coughs> different companies have different types of marketing. Some companies have no direct international marketing. For example, you just made some wallet, do you understand wallet? And you just sell online in Korea. But somebody from Finland sees your wallet and they send you an email. Can you, se can you sell me one of your wallets? And you say, okay, and then you send them the wallet, okay? So you didn't make any plan. You're not making any plan to sell to the foreign customers, or you're not doing any marketing for the foreign customers, but somebody might contact you to buy something. That's a no direct foreign marketing. <clears throat> then we have infrequent international marketing and regular international marketing. Just here, maybe we have a company and we're just doing marketing in our own country. But sometimes we have too much, we make too much of the product. For example, we're making steel. Do you understand steel? Yeah. 
we make too much steel, more than we need for the Korean market. So we decide to sell some of our steel in China. But just, just this year, because next year maybe we use all the steel in Korea. So just infrequent means we don't really plan to, but for some reason we start to do the marketing, but it's not regular. Then regular is getting more regular, and then we move on to international marketing, where the company makes the plan to sell in another country, to do business and sell our product in another country, and we make a strategy and a plan to do that, and a budget. And then global marketing is when we decide to sell our product, not just in one other country or two other countries, but in many countries and different continents. <coughs> so, with no direct marketing, it's called reacting. Reacting. The product indirectly reaches the market. Okay? We could have trading company. So a trading company, we're just selling our wallets in Korea, but a trading company thinks that our wallets could sell well in another country, so they start to buy our wallets and sell them in another country. Okay? Or we, we give them the permission to do that. International customers contact the firm. Uh, internet orders, and so on. Infrequent international marketing, temporary surplus to sales, but we don't we don't continue. Regular international marketing. So we start to make some production capacity. So one part of our factory, this is producing for the international market. Okay. Uh, sometimes we can employ an intermediary. So we want to sell in China. We find an agent in China, intermediary or agent. And we ask them to help us to sell our product in China. Okay? Or moving on a step, we can start to send our own sales force, send our own people to China, or hire. Instead of using the agent, hire somebody in China to work for our company. So the international market is different than our home market, so we adapt the product. If you're selling kimchi in China, are you going to sell the same kimchi as Korea, or are you going to adapt to the taste for the Chinese market? Adapt the taste? What will you change about the kimchi? Do you, Chinese students, can you put up your hand, who's from China? Do you like kimchi? Yeah. How would you change kimchi for the Chinese market? How would you change the kimchi for China? factory where it's adding more sugar okay and <clears throat> we are depending on the profits we get from the other market this is in our budget we need the profit from the other country then international marketing proactive fully committed so we have some production even takes place on the international land okay. so we go there and we even start producing. We start making kimchi in China. Okay. Uh, an example here is a US air conditioner company. Do you not understand air conditioning? Yes. So uh, they were doing badly in the US. They weren't selling their air conditioner well in the US. The company had some problem. They were just a domestic company, just selling air conditioners for the US. So then they decided we're going to enter the Chinese market. So they had to design a new air conditioner. Okay? Because usually the US uh, house is a very big house, but in China they have a smaller apartment, so they had to make a different type of air conditioner for the Chinese market. So they, they went to China, and they start the factory in China, production facility in China, and they start manufacturing the air conditioners in China for selling in China. Okay? This is full 
international marketing company. And now they are an MNE, a multinational enterprise, because they started production in the foreign country. <clears throat> then global marketing. We have a global view about marketing. Uh, <clears throat> we think about the product, price, place, and promotion. And the market is segmented by income levels, use, or other factors. So an example of this is Ferrari. Ferrari ha maybe has a global, many lux luxury products have a global view. Instead of adapting their product for different countries, they segment the market not by country, but by income level. Okay? So just I'm targeting the top, if I'm selling Ferrari, I'm targeting just extremely rich people all over the world, right? And I might think that the very rich people might have a similar culture all over the world. The very rich people might be more similar to each other than they are to the people in their own country. Okay? So I'm going to look at them as one market segment. So that's taking a global viewpoint of the marketing. <coughs> so uh, just some more definitions when we're talking about marketing, words we need to know. Uh, features and benefits. Features, how the product looks physically. The chair is black and one meter high. Okay, So like we talk about feature. Benefits, what the product helps us with. For example, the chair allows us to sit comfortably. Standardized and customized. Standardized means more or less similar feature and benefits of the product or service. So Ferrari sells a standardized car. If you buy a Ferrari in China or in the US or in Korea, there's no difference, right? It's the same. Okay, same features and same benefits. Customized is a product made or adapted especially for one person, group or country. Okay, so example, even Coca-Cola, they customize their cola for the different countries. They put a lot of sugar in the cola in Korea compared to in another country, right? Or another example is Lay's potato chips. Do you know potato chips? In Korea, you like shrimp flavor potato chips. Do you like shrimp yeah. potato chips? Yeah. yeah, but they never sell shrimp potato chips in Ireland or UK. Maybe even the US. People would be like, <laughs> shrimp and potato chip. No. Right? They don't like that kind of taste. So the different people has different taste. So the potato chip company makes a cheese flavor for Ireland. And Lay's is a US potato chip company. And shrimp flavor for Korea. Okay? So we can see the difference between customized. Customized means made especially for you. Standardized. Standardized means just the same for everybody. Which one is cheaper for the company? Standardized or customized? Standardized, right? If I just sell the same product everywhere with the same marketing, it, it's cheap. Okay? But customized is going to be more expensive. Economies of scale is a cost advantage. So with standardization, we have economies of scale advantage. <coughs> The more of a single good we produce, the lower the price per unit fixed cost, the cost of building a factory. So Ferrari might have just one factory in Italy, right? So they, don't, they just have the same machine for making the cars. They have to change the car for every country. They have to make different factories. So it's going to cost a lot of money. So economies of scale, we make a lot of cars with one factory. We don't have to pay for new machinery, we don't have to pay for the workers, right? It's a lower fixed cost. For example, the cost of building a factory. Because these costs are shared over a large number of goods. Uh, we're going to talk about products and services. Do you know the difference between a product and a service? What's the difference between a product and a service? Companies make products and services. What's the difference? 
for instance, a product is something tangible and a service is something you maintain, like, say, for instance, service in a car, a service like fixing the engine, yeah, product is like selling a car, a service is like to maintain the engine. Okay, so tangible means you can touch it, see the product, right? But service, you can't touch or see, right? Like staying the night in the hotel, you can't replicate, okay? Something which a person or company makes which I can touch, a pencil. Something which provides which I cannot touch, a night stay in a hotel. So discuss with your partner. What kind of standardized products or services can be sold all over the world? What features and benefits do these products or services have? What do you think of some examples? I mentioned Ferrari. But try to think of some examples of standardized product or service which can be sold, you think, all over the world. The same product sold in different countries. And what feature or benefit do they have? Anybody else come up with any other things that can be standardized? McDonald's. Huh? Hamburger. Hamburger. McDonald's hamburger. Anything else? Electronics. Electronics. So like smartphone and it's like TV. That kind of thing. Socks. Socks. Okay. So uh, we can get some ideas that we can save money if we use economies of scale we can make all the smartphones or TVs together in the <coughs> same using the same machinery the same factory same marketing type of marketing maybe and we can sell it so then discuss these questions with your partner what technologies have helped to share similar <coughs> ideas across the world do you think consumers' tastes are becoming more similar or more different? Thank <laughs> you. 
사람들의 취향이 좀 계속 비슷해지고 있는 것 같아요. 계속 달라지고 있어요. 그래서 비슷해지긴 한데 좀 똑같지 않아요. 나라마다 차이가 많이 있어요. 먼 선까지는 비슷해지다 않아도 미묘한 선에서부터는 안 절대 달라지고 있어요. 오히려 오히려 엄청 많이 서구가 됐죠. 그렇게 변하지 않는 것 같아요. Okay, so uh, Shim Sung Min, what do you think about the first question? The internet? Anything else? I don't know what is technology exactly. The internet is a technology. What? TV can be a technology. Smartphones. They're all included in technologies. Right. Well, those kind of things. Nowadays, people uh, can see the same ideas. Right? And spread the ideas. So let's have a hands up for the second question. So first of all, put up your hand if you think the customer's taste is becoming more similar. So hands up. Who thinks consumer's taste is becoming more similar? Who thinks consumer's taste is becoming more different? Why do you think more different? Uh, because nowadays there are a lot of different products mm. and people uh, start to, to separate with the in taste. Uh, for example, app, uh, smartphones, there are a lot of different smartphones, such as app, uh, iPhone, Samsung, LG, and the tastes are, the tastes are different. Okay. Why did you say similar? Uh, I actually think that, that the tastes are getting getting similar at, at certain points. Mm -hmm. Like they uh, they uh, uh, they are like to uh, follow the trends, mm -hmm. but at certain points, they they uh, I think the customers have their own taste that can be changed or, or can be uh, similar to other people. But in general, the tastes are getting similar. Okay. So uh, we'll watch a video which will discuss about that a little bit later. So <coughs> we can see here this, there has always been uh, the international trade. We had the Silk Road from uh, Asia to Europe a thousand years ago, which was a very profitable trade route, right? And uh, <coughs> people have realized that by international trade, they can make a profit and get a big advantage, right? Especially since World War II, the international business has grown a lot. We have the WTO, which is an organization of countries which agree different rules for trading and punishments if you don't follow the rules. Like kind of rules like uh, you can't block the put a too high import tax on the other country or that you can't block their products for no reason okay we have a lot of free trade agreements do you know this what does this mean North American free trade agreements North American free trade agreements okay uh, in the late 90s between Mexico and the US and Canada it was a big boost for the Mexican economy okay they could manufacture a lot of things in Mexico and then sell them in the US without paying any tariffs. So even companies like Kia started factories in Mexico, right? Then they could sell their goods without paying any tariff. Do you understand tariff? Yeah. Tariff is like tax for importing. So mainly free trade agreement means no tariffs. Okay? Uh, they made an agreement with uh, Korea and the US, Korea and Europe, right? The EU, the European Union, is one big tra free trade area. So these days, again, some Korean company can manufacture in Poland, in the east of Europe, right? 
and then sell in Germany with no import tax. So because of these kind of free trade agreements, of course, the trade is, is increasing, right? Just Korea just recently signed the free trade agreement, relatively recently, with Europe and the US, right? So all the tariffs are not finished yet. It takes about 10 years. Slowly, the tariff goes down over time. Usually, they are mostly disappeared by 10 years, right? So for example, things like foreign cars in Korea is very expensive, right? But uh, as the tariff goes down over time, it should be getting cheaper, right? So we have the free market system. Uh, we have 3 billion new consumers. Uh, for example, China and India, they had a closed economy before in the late 70s, right? Uh, 80s. In the early 90s especially, the economy started to liberalize. Also Russia, okay? Many of the emerging economies, they started to liberalize and open up to the world. So, of course, in the 90s, a lot of companies entered India and China, right? But some of them were not so successful. Some were successful, some weren't. But we have all of these new consumers. And then the growing impact of the internet and uh, the TV makes uh, international business easier, right? You can send the emails and so on. So Theodore Levin had this idea in 1983 that companies should grow by selling standardized products all over the world. So at that time, people thought that's the best way to go, right? People's tastes are getting more similar. So let's just make a standardized product and sell it, the same product, all over the world. And he said, gone are the custom differences in national and regional preferences. So he said that people's preference is all going to get very similar. People is all like very similar. So this idea lasted just for 10 years. But co consumers had trouble relating to homogeneous products. Homogeneous means the same. Homo means the same in English, right? So. Maybe he got a bit excited and people here thought standardization will be great. We get the economies of scale and we sell the same product everywhere. But they found out customers didn't like the same product, right? If you made just cheese potato chips, Korean people didn't like the cheese potato chips and they didn't buy them in the end, right? So we have to try and make a strategy here, depending on the product and the market. We may pursue a standardized market strategy for one product, like Ferrari or socks or TVs, right? Make the same TV and sell all over the world, depending on the product, okay? But we could have a local strategy for another product. So for example, Procter & Gamble, diapers. Do you understand diaper? Baby wears a diaper, right? Uh, so that P&G makes diaper the same all over the world. It's a very simple thing, right? A little bit like socks, okay? Uh, but for the, it's the same company, P&G is the same company, but for a different product, it has a different strategy. Do you understand detergent? So detergent for washing the clothes. What kind of smell do you like from your clothes? I'm not going to ask the boys because probably they don't care, right? <laughs> Girls, what kind of smell do you like from your clothes? Hmm? Spring? S smell of spring? <laughs> smell of flowers? Hmm? <coughs> well, people have different tastes in different countries, right? Maybe in Ireland they like the spring. It smells like the spring. In Korea they might like lavender. It smells like lavender. Okay? And people like different. Somebody. Maybe in Korea you like your clothes to be very soft, but in another country they don't need their clothes to be soft, or they don't like their clothes to be soft. Okay? So they tried, PNG tried first to sell the standard detergent. But what happened? People in Korea is not buying the PNG detergent. They don't like the smell and they don't like the their clothes are too hard. So PNG has to change their strategy and make a local strategy if they want to sell detergent in Korea. They need to adapt 
dairy detergent for the Korean market. Hire some Korean research and development scientists to make the kind of smell that Korean people like. <clears throat> so, you can also have a global strategy. Local is global and local together. Okay? So, global strategy, standardized. Local strategy, customized. Okay? Local is a strategy, a hybrid means mixed strategy, which combines both the global and the local aspect of business. So here's an example of global marketing, just to give us an idea of a combination. Do you know Absolute Vodka? Yeah. Did they sell that in Korea? Yes. Yes. So they made an advertising campaign. I'm not sure if you can see this well, but the advertising campaign was the same idea, global idea, that we're going to have uh, our bottle is going to be part of some very famous national picture, right? Like, for example, in Rome, the scooter is famous, so the bottle is like a scooter, okay? Uh, maybe this is Russia, and this is a famous scene in Russia, so the bottle is in here, in the brick wall. Okay, or over here in London we have the Downing Street, and the bottle again is included here. So, the idea, the global marketing idea is the same. Use the bottle in the national picture. Okay, but it's changed for every country. So this is a global strategy. Okay, we make some part of the product is the same, right? Uh, like the idea or the research and development, and then we just change it, some part to make more adapted to the local country. So this is a global strategy. So how does this, we get some money savings here, absolute, by economies of scale. Because instead of paying the marketing person to come up with a very innovative and new marketing idea in every country. Let's say they sell vodka in 100 countries, right? They have to pay marketing company in 100 countries to come up with a new idea. But instead, they just pay their marketing in their headquarters in Russia, right? Their R&D place. And they come up with the idea. Use the bottle in the national picture. Right? And then they give that just to the local company. They don't have to come up with the idea now. All they have to do is just uh, put this in a picture. So it costs less money, and it also has uh, advantage because we have the local advantage. It's localized to the people. So trying to combine the benefit of the economy of scale while also making it localized. That's the idea of the global strategy. So we're going to watch a video about this uh, local strategy. So <clears throat> we also had an online book on global marketing, which is uh, where we are going to watch uh, the video from, which is on the uh, syllabus here. It, it was. There was two books. <coughs> so if you want to see this book, you just need to uh, copy and paste the link.
So I made just some course pack here, and we can see the book here is in this website, in International Marketing. This is this uh, reading <coughs> book. So we can see here, you can read about uh, mark, global marketing and some of the things that we, we discussed. So, uh, we're going to watch this lady, is from uh, Pepsi. Do you know Pepsi? Yeah. <clears throat> so Pepsi, she's going to talk about Pepsi's strategy for different products. So. Uh, let's just have a look at the question that we're going to try to answer. So what are the advantages of a global strategy? <clears throat> what is the advantage of a local strategy? So she's going to talk about the advantage of both strategies for Pepsi. Okay, And then why does she like a global strategy? She likes a global strategy for Pepsi. Why? do better? Those that have a great global strategy, offering everyone in the world the same product, or those with a local strategy, tailoring products to different markets? I've spent the last three years thinking about these issues at PepsiCo, and in my opinion, you need to pursue both global and local strategies to drive your company's growth. That's because a purely global strategy doesn't maximize opportunities in local markets. And a purely local strategy doesn't take advantage of your company's economies of scale. There's a middle ground called global, which leverages both to increase revenue and reduce costs. To be global, you need to think carefully about your organization strategy and your business strategy. And you need to decide when to leverage local variation and when to leverage global scale. First, let's talk about organization strategy. This is all about how your corporate headquarters and local business units work together and make decisions. In companies with a purely global strategy, headquarters has all the power and pushes decisions out to the local markets. In ones with a purely local strategy, headquarters consolidate all the different strategies coming from the local markets. A global organization strategy calls for a matrix structure. Leaders from headquarters and local business units both help to shape the overall company's business strategies. This requires a lot of coordination, but it pays dividends. Once your organization is global, you can develop a global business strategy. At PepsiCo, we have 400 plus brands around the world, but we've chosen 12 of them to be mega brands like Pepsi Soda and Lay's Potato Chips. These brands will have a global innovation platform and marketing campaigns. But how we support these global brands in different markets depends on each brand's local position. And that depends on things like the brand's market share, the nature of the competition, and the brand's growth potential. For example, suppose a brand has a strong growth potential but limited market share and tough competition in a local market. In this case, we might want to invest heavily in supporting its growth by directly <coughs> attacking its competitors. When you bring together global focus and local execution, you reduce costs thanks to scale. And you boost revenues by growing your brands in local markets. Go global, and you change the game of global business. Which companies do better? Those that have a great global strategy, offering everyone in the world the same product, or those with a local strategy, tailoring products to different markets. I have spent the last three years thinking about these issues at PepsiCo, and in my opinion, you need to pursue both global and local strategies to drive your company's growth. Okay, so she works in that area, making that kind of marketing strategy in Pepsi. Oh, right, and she says that you need what? What do you need? Which does she prefer, global or local? <coughs> both, right? She says you need to use both of them together to drive the growth here. That's because a purely global strategy doesn't maximize opportunities in local markets. 
And a purely local strategy doesn't take advantage of your company's economies of scale. So what's the problem with the global strategy? It doesn't maximize. Do you understand maximize? Maximize makes the most of opportunities. You might miss opportunities in the local area. And what's wrong with the what's wrong with the uh, local? Just using a local approach, you lose the economies of scale advantage. Okay. There's a middle ground called global, which leverages both to increase revenue and reduce costs. To be global, you need to think carefully about your organization strategy and your business strategy. And you need to decide when to leverage local variation and when to leverage global scale. Okay, so you need to decide based on your product when you should use more global or when you should use more local, right? First, let's talk about organization strategy. This is all about how your corporate headquarters and local business units work together and make decisions. So the organization strategy is we have, she's going to tell us a different way, right? We have the headquarters here in, let's say, in Korea, right? Do you understand headquarters? And then we have a lot of offices in other countries. So we have to work together to make decisions. That's what she's talking about here. In companies with a purely global strategy, headquarters has all the power and pushes decisions out to the local markets. So if we're global, doing the global strategy, just the headquarter makes the decision, right? And they tell them, you do this, you do this, you do this, right? Everything has to be the same, right? We want you to do this for your marketing. We want you to use this product. We want you to do this. And they just say, okay, right? <coughs> In ones with a purely local strategy, headquarters consolidate all the different strategies coming from the local markets. On the other hand, the local one, they, they tell the headquarters the strategy, right? And headquarters tries to make some strategy out of their ideas, mixed together. A global organization strategy calls for a matrix structure. Leaders from headquarters and local business units both help to shape the overall company's business strategies. So she says a matrix here. Matrix is not clear organization. Like matrix could look like that, right? So they work together to make, uh, instead of being the headquarters just telling the local areas or the local areas just making decisions and telling headquarters, they talk and discuss with each other, okay? And come to the conclusion together about what's the best strategy for the business. This requires a lot of coordination, but it pays dividends. So it, it's not easy, right? It, you need a lot of commu good communication and good coordination and time. But it pays dividends means it, it g gives the advantage to the company, right? Because if we just make the decision in headquarters, a lot of companies have made pro uh, mistakes. Like an example is Nike in China. Nike designed an advertisement to use all over the world with Michael Jordan. Do you know Michael Jordan? For selling the Nike runners. And the advertisement was that Michael Jordan is fighting against himself. He has a ghost of Michael Jordan, right? And then at the end of the advertisement, he kills himself, right? So it's like he won because he killed himself and he was his main challenger. Right? Getting over himself was his main competition. That was the point of the ad. But it was a disaster in China because they really did, culture didn't like the idea of somebody killing themselves. Right? So the advertisement was Nike lost a lot of sales, right? So in that case, they did the global strategy. They didn't listen to the local area, right? Maybe somebody in China told them, well, that's not a good idea. And they said, be quiet, what do you know about marketing? I'm from the US. We don't know anything. All right? Just do what the headquarters tells you. Okay? And they said, okay, you're the boss. <laughs> right? So we can have some problem if we just use the glo global strategy. Right? The local strategy, everybody has their own idea about the strategy. It might be a bit confusing, right? So if we coordinate, we, it means we respect all the opinions and we talk to all the people. 
and then we can make a strategy together for the company. <coughs> What's the best strategy to make in this case? So then uh, let's take a break now uh, for 10 minutes. <coughs> Thank you. 